To get us started, I want to set a backdrop for the conversation, and I'm going to use one of my dearest friends, Jake. Jake just bought a, an incredibly beautiful Harley motorcycle not too long ago, and I find that he's not riding the bike. And figuring out why that is is incredibly important to me. And what I've realized is that Jake bought a bike that's too big for him. And this segment isn't about motorcycles, but the, the understanding of how the human brain is wired, I think is really important. And Jake gives us a good example. He's bought too much bike, and so he doesn't ride it. And the fear that drives that decision is very similar to what I'm seeing happening in the artificial intelligence world right now, or really in society as artificial applies to the work that we do and the people that we interact with. Fear is an incredibly human emotion when it comes to staying alive, if you will. If we don't understand a thing, if we don't feel fully comfortable with a thing, we might avoid it. And as we are wading through what artificial intelligence might do for society, we're at this natural inflection point where there's still so very much we don't understand. But at the same time, we all understand that there may be some exciting pieces and some really valuable tenets of what artificial intelligence might bring to our organizations, to our sectors or industries, and to the world at large. So it helps, I think, to start with START, which is a simple definition of artificial intelligence. It's a simulation of human intelligence processed by machines, specifically computers, as we're often talking about generative AI today and some of the chat GPT models you might be familiar with. But simply put, it's machines or computers processing information and simulating human intelligence or how humans might make a decision. Now, what this is not is machines or computers being sentient and making decisions exactly as a human might. And nor are we at the point in uh, the dystopian movie or future that we might think about where artificial intelligence is exactly thinking as a human is. We're not there yet. And as we continue with our conversation today, we'll talk about what that might look like further down the road. But for the purposes of defining artificial intelligence as it exists today, it's computers or machines processing data to simulate human intelligence. Now, there's a second definition that I want to jump into, and that's threat. As we're assessing the ethical implications of artificial intelligence, part of what we have to consider is where there might be threats to the sustainability of humanity. And threat, as a very simple definition, is capability times intent. Now, capability, the ability to affect a thing or an outcome, is very straightforward. Am I capable of talking about artificial intelligence? The answer is yes. Now, intent is a more subjective type of measure, and intent is the desire to affect a thing or an outcome. And that's a little harder to parse because it requires us to understand motive and drivers and how a person might think about orienting to a problem, a solution, or a, a, an issue, if you will. And so as we define threat, capability times intent, it is sometimes easier to assess whether there's a capability to cause harm or to provide value. Uh, the harder piece is to assess whether there's intent to do that. But threat requires both of those pieces. And as it pertains to artificial intelligence, we are starting to understand capability and it's harder to parse what intent is. Now, back to where we started with the definition of artificial intelligence, we haven't built sentient machines. And so intent for us is not about the machines, but more about uh, the creators and how we are informing or making data available to artificial intelligence platforms. And so intent for us requires us to know who has created these things, the bias that they might have, the orientation to technology and whether they believe, as one might in the medical field, that we have an ethical responsibility or obligation to do no harm. 
for us to fully understand if artificial intelligence poses a threat, we have to understand the capability of the technology, which is moving at an exponential pace and the intent of its creators or the guidelines and guardrails that we might put in place, hence having a conversation about AI ethics. The third definition that's, I think, really critical for us to work through is risk. Now, risk is, I think, for me, um, an equally, equally interesting definition and one that we can simplify. So I'll distill it to two important pieces, threat times vulnerability and threat we've talked about, right? Capability times intent. And so that requires us to unpack what vulnerability is. And if we might be vulnerable to what artificial intelligence might be able to do in society. And so uh, as we talk about threat and risk, threat being that capability times intent and risk being threat times vulnerability, what I wanna highlight here is that there are just a number of unknowns. We don't fully understand the capability of artificial intelligence. We don't fully understand the intent of its creators, especially as we add more people into the mix driving the artificial intelligence industry forward. And then lastly, on the risk front, uh, as we know, we've just defined we don't fully understand the threat. Our vulnerabilities are hard to quantify today, which requires us as a society to take stake in where we are with respect to technology improvements and the pace of technology movement, along with some of the guardrails and frameworks we might build around our current understanding of artificial intelligence and perhaps our assessment of where that technology might move in the future. So we've just defined artificial intelligence and then we've put words to threat and of course risk with respect to not fully understanding the pieces there. And that gives us, I think, some appropriate fodder by which to move forward with AI ethics balancing on a tightrope. On the heels of a couple definitions, I want to change not only venue, but add a guest into the equation. I've invited David Vogelier. He's the co-founder of Buddy. He has spent quite a bit of time in the creative agency world and has now ported that into being a founder and using some of the cutting technology that is out there, particularly AI, as we're discussing that specific technology. And he's here to break down some of what it is, how it works, and ultimately how we might put it to use in our organizations. So with that, David. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you, man. Good how see you, you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I've got this like uh, mystery, this black box that is artificial intelligence. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the ace paraphrase version of definition is machines replicating what might feel like human decision making. Sure. And I, I'd love A, for you to correct me and maybe dial that definition in a little bit, uh, but then break it down because I think as we talk about AI, we're talking about this kind of holistic thing yeah. that, that maybe we haven't defined well, but then there are pieces under that. I mean, we're talking machine learning and deep learning and natural language processing. And I know you've played with some of these technologies, so I figured you'd be a great person to have on and just kind of give us a scoop Scoop, if yeah. you will. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, AI, you're right, is a, it's a really big box. Yeah. There's a lot of things. Um, like you mentioned, machine learning, deep learning, which is kind of a subset of machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, NLPs are natural language processors, NLUs, natural language understanders, um, generative AI, transformers, LLMs, on and on. It's it's <laughs> The it, list goes. It, go, it goes infinitely. At the end of the day, it's, it is a... It is a lot of math, uh, linear algebra, all sorts of stuff like that that's trying to mimic um, predictable decisions being made. Mm. But like you could start as simple as, you know, if you think like not true AI, but like just basically conditional logic, which nobody except maybe somebody who's trying to spike their their their, uh, their funding deck is going to call that AI. Okay. But really, it's just, um, I have this input, yeah. something needs to happen, and I have what I would like is a predictable output, right? Mm. So for um, things like machine learning, machine learning is great because like it's really kind of top level math. Um, it's stuff that some folks could probably just read themselves straight out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of supervised training. So like I might have a ton of emails and I want to develop a new spam filter, something like okay. that. 
And so I will take all these emails and I will have, um, I can look at them and say like, out of these 100 emails, these 70 are spam, which is like not a bad ratio. Yeah. Uh, and I will label them as such. And then I'll take these 30 that are good and I'll label them as not spam. I'll run it through machine learning. And the idea of machine learning is like, look, I have the data and I have the output. Mm -hmm. I want you to define the algorithm. So figure out why these 70 are spam and why these 30 aren't. And they probably have some similar tenets of yes. the 70. Yes. Some similarities. Yeah. And that might be how we define spam. Exactly. And then the other 30, because they don't have those tenets, are not spam. Yeah. Okay. Um, and for humans, like, it's hard to really define why this is spam and why this is not, right? Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of different things that go into that. And the machine might come up with something totally, totally different. Um, mm. I, it was actually really fun. I remember years and years ago, DARPA was doing... Um, you know, one of their competitions about self-driving cars. Yeah. And somebody was using basically um, uh, machine learning and some, some deep learning stuff to train their car. They're driving around and like, I want my car to learn how to drive yeah. by watching me drive. So they did, you know, thousands and thousands of miles like that. And like, the machine's like, all right, I'm good to go. I know yeah. how to do this. <laughs> and they let it fly and it was driving around fine, fine, doing great. And it went across a bridge. And as soon as it got across the bridge, it tried to run off the bridge. Mm. And they gr immediately grabbed it, thankfully, mm -hmm. um, and were able to look at the data. And they're like, the machine thought that on either side of the car, there always needed to be grass. And that's the uh, machine learned. The machine uh, learned that like, oh, oh, if I'm driving straight, there's grass on one side or the other. Yeah. So when it didn't find grass, it's like, I need to turn around immediately. Okay. So that's kind of the other side of, yeah. of like, I don't know how to tell it how to drive. It'll just figure it out. And it didn't quite figure but it out. But it doesn't quite figure it out. And yeah. so so we're, we're really balancing some things, which are human inputs. Yeah. Sometimes the lack of human input, right, yes. in this yeah. drive off the bridge example. But you've mentioned math a couple yeah. times. And what it feels like is we're really taking math, clever math mm -hmm. at that, like really, really smart math. But can, can we talk a little bit about... Um, computational linguistics and, and and perhaps how we in the same way we take these 70 emails are spam because we learned and these 30 aren't um, how we might take language and get into natural language processing yeah. because that's it feels like where everybody's focused in the industry right now yeah. or at least the layman if you will it's oh my gosh I can put in a prompt in chat GPT or Bard or any other kind of generative AI platform is gonna spit out an answer yeah. but even that is math right yeah it feels like I'm talking to a human but that's just computations happening behind the scenes yeah like think of like uh, like gigantic matrices right so okay. like like you probably did if you did college level math i'm sure you've gotten at least three by three i think i stuff passed like yeah, yeah no saw, I've, I've seen your there we go. Looks good. but there and we can do those as humans we can do those and it takes a minute to get through a three by three yeah. imagine them being instead of a three by three imagine them being a 10 by 10 by 10 mm. um and like it's not that the person couldn't do the math the math is actually really very basic step mm -hmm. by step mm -hmm. but doing it over and over again really quickly at that's where a machine beats human all day yeah so um and and going back to the email stuff, what's really good about it and what we as humans have a really hard time defining is context. It feels very natural to us. You know, a wor a s three words of this email is misspelled and you start to get something in the back of your neck tickling. You're like, I don't think this is a real email, mm. um, but I can't quite tell you why. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, stuff like that. And the machine will actually take that language and start to look at it and not just the words, it'll actually grab the context around it. Mm -hmm. So it'll see like, okay, this sentence, you know, Jill runs down the hill and it'll see something like that really simple structured over and over and over again yeah. and it'll see these outliers like Jill the hill she ran down mm. and you're like that's not wrong but it's also not, it's quite, not right. quite right so it's looking for these outliers yeah. and then we use uh, supervised training to label it right okay so we would say like hey I know this is bad and I want you to find out why and that's where it's looking for these weird nuances where I would be like the sentence feels wrong, but I don't know how to tell you. It feels that. It's wrong, but English. how do I quantify that? Yeah. Now we're finding systems that can. Yeah, yeah exactly. Quantify. Okay. So it, it takes those little words and cuts them down into different pieces. And so, like one word means something in one context, and the same word means something in a completely different context. Mm -hmm. And the ability to analyze that like quickly at scale is where machines really highlight, especially when you're talking about like 
big GPU, stuff that could do like massive computations in microseconds. Mm. And so similarly, as we're as we think about language and the relation, the relationship from one word to another, yeah. uh, math happens there as well. And so um, I, I think there's. It's funny as I talk about AI because I live in this world sure. somewhat. I'm like, there's this graphic floating around. I don't know if it's floating around, but we'll make sure folks <laughs> can see it. Being able to extrapolate from uh, man to woman mm -hmm. is just a set of numbers, and we can do math yeah. to get from man to woman. Um, but that same math can get us from uh, king to queen, and that same math can get us from say uncle to aunt and it's it's really the it's the same equation that says if you've got man plus royalty you can get to king and so if man goes to woman then woman plus royalty will get you to queen and like that's a yeah. distilled version yeah, but yeah. really it feels and this is i think the distinction i'd like i'd like you to help me make perhaps artificial intelligence of the machines think like humans yeah. is different from probably where we are today, which is augmented intelligence. Yeah. Okay. A bit. I mean, like you're, so some of the stuff you're talking about might be like neural networks, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's a, a lot of those are used in like unsupervised training and deep learning and stuff like that, where it's these tiny little nodes that answer one very simple mathematical formula. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of them spread across and they're okay. all answering at the same time. Yep. Then they go layer to layer to layer. And if you think about like, I mean, the, their neural networks are designed to act like human brain. Yeah. That's kind of what's happening anyway. Like you see someone and you will the same thing, right? Like yeah. I see a woman walking towards me. I'd like, oh, that's a woman. She's wearing a crown. That means something. But mm -hmm. like the crown means crown by itself without the, uh, with, without the context of the woman. With the context of the woman, you are Get back to it, and that is what they're doing. They're like yeah. instead of instead of looking at the queen queen as a singular entity, yeah. they look at all the context that's wrapped uh, around it, uh, uh. and how you're supposed to address those things. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I feel like we could nerd here, oh, we for, nerd here for hours for hours. And so, you know, if you were introducing somebody to artificial intelligence, where would you have them start? Yeah, I would start with, honestly, um, there's two places, really. If you want to just play with it mm -hmm. and, like, be comfortable with it and, like, what can it do? Yeah. I mean, Chat GPT is, always, is, is obviously the hot sure. one. Uh, Cloud AI is a good one. It's free as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just really interesting. I remember when Chat GPT dropped, we were all doing dumb things. Mm -hmm. We were all like, all right, I want you to rewrite the Declar Declaration of Independence as a Dr. Seuss story. And it was wild because it was it was, it was it was able to take one context and another context yeah. and shove them together into something. And I think that's... When I think about learning something that's really technical and new, I'm, I actually tell people to look for those hits of dopamine mm. that literally make you feel good. Mm. So like doing those little things really quick and forth to get those kind of a feel for it can almost do anything mm -hmm. is where I would start. Once you get there, start figuring out where you want to use it and how you want to use it. Start yeah. small, start really simple problems. Um, I use it all the time to, so for developers, uh, what we really love is focus time and we don't like switching context. Yeah. So I use it a lot for stuff that I need to do to switch context for. So as a dumb example, um, I, uh, developers will have to write user acceptance tests. So mm -hmm. like we write a piece of software and then I need somebody else to test it and I need to tell them what I want them to do. That context switch takes a really long time. Mm. Like it takes me out of my coding yeah. into like, I need to write like a human, I need to describe something in real <laughs> plain English and simple. Yeah. I can use ChatGPT um, to say like, here is what my interface looks like. I can describe it in just plain words. Mm -hmm. Now give me 20 um, user acceptance tests. It'll mm. spit them out in a heartbeat. And so those type of things, we start to see like, all right, it is fun, it is powerful. Now it's productive. Now it's useful. It's, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I heard right, find something that makes it fun to explore yeah. to start. Like, yeah. Enjoy yourself. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, I think I, uh, I used it to... Um, <laughs> I used it the other day to write a marketing, like uh, basically build me an Instagram post or a social sure, media yeah, post, yeah. but in the voice of Samuel L. Jackson, That's nice. which yeah. I thought was hilarious, yeah. right? Uh, but was it particularly productive? Am I going to post that post? 
I might, but it wouldn't be the professional context sure. yeah. in which I used it. But that's the fun. Like, I just want to see Samuel Jackson yell at my Instagram followers, <laughs> yeah. right? And then the second step you're saying to, to get acclimated is take that fun and then point it toward productivity. Yeah. Find somewhere where this might make your life a little easier and just test it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. I like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to let folks like go play a little bit. They're going to work through uh, some more content and then you and I are going to come back and we're going to talk briefly about some of the places that you've seen application of AI and maybe some of the guardrails that we might talk about. How's that? Sounds great. All right. I'll see you in a few.